great. Thank you so much for that introduction and a little bit of background uh, into what I've been working on. So I'm part of the CRISPR gene editing group at IDT, so I'm located in Iowa in America. And so this talk is going to be a little bit different because we use CRISPR in cells to do uh, mediate genomic editing. Um, and so the nanopore sequencing is one of the methods that we're uh, attempting to use to look at CRISPR gene editing events. So it's kind of a twofold approach where we use the CRISPR enzymes to mediate editing in cells and then use CRISPR Cas9 enrichment to then analyze what we've done to the cells of interest. And so thanks to the previous speakers who have done a nice job of introducing this CRISPR Cas9 mediated uh, double stranded break. Um, but just to follow up on that and give a little bit uh, more information, or probably the same information, <laughs> uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is an RNA-guided endonuclease. So it requires these um, RNA molecules that confer the specificity, uh, 20 bases of specificity to your uh, target region. Uh, and that tells your uh, Cas9 where to create a double-stranded break. Um, you can deliver the RNAs as either the two-part system that uh, Christopher just uh, me mentioned, where you have your CRRNA that's target-specific, along with a universal tracer RNA that uh, goes with every single uh, CRISPR RNA, or you can merge these two into a single-guide RNA where it's a one-molecule system uh, that's delivered with the Cas9 nuclease as a ribonuclear protein complex. And so... As I mentioned, uh, I've been using this to uh, mediate genome editing within cells of interest. So we deliver this Cas9 ribonuclear protein complex to cells, and it generates a double-stranded break in the genomic DNA. And this double-stranded break can then be repaired by undergoing one of two, uh, there are more pathways, but we focus on these two repair pathways uh, that happen within the, the native cells. So if you have no donor DNA, um, then you can see on the left we have this non-homologous end joining pathway. And so this is an error-prone repair pathway that generates insertions or deletions at that double-stranded break. Uh, so this is a great way to knock out a gene of interest by disrupting the protein function, for example. However, if you deliver these uh, reagents with a donor DNA, and that could be uh, double-stranded or single-stranded here, that contains homology to where you've created this double-stranded break, then we can now uh, create specific insertions or point mutations in your genomic DNA. And this is by using the homology-directed repair or HDR pathway. And so why would you want to utilize this HDR pathway in cells? I mean, there are many <laughs> potential applications that you could think of. Um, one would be to maybe create or, or repair a, a clinically relevant SNP, a single base mutation, or to do a directed amino acid change. Um, you can also tag proteins of interest with these small tags, flag or V5. And those are very easy to analyze using traditional short read sequencing because they're quite small, so you can capture them in an amplicon. However, if you're trying to insert a fluorescent marker such as GFP or mCherry to label uh, where a protein is in within the cells or insert foreign coding material such as creating transgenic plants or animals, these insertions are, are larger than what we're able to analyze using traditional short read sequencing. And so analyzing these results can be challenging. And so in the experiments that I'm showing today, we've um, used a, a single-stranded or double-stranded DNA to try to mediate various insertion sizes uh, to see how well these uh, go into the cells of interest when we're using CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. So what we've done is we've designed various donors with a uh, 300, a 500, or a 1,000 base insert. And then we've used 100 nucleotide homology arms uh, to use this HDR to insert these sequences. And so you can see that highlighted on the bottom of the screen here, where we have the homology arms in blue on the 5 prime end, in gray on the 3 prime end. And then you can see the CRISPR-Cas9 guide in red, the 20 base sequence with the PAM, the NGG PAM highlighted in yellow, and then the various inserts that we're trying to form at the bottom of the screen. So these reagents were delivered into K562 cells along with a Cas9 ribonuclear protein, and we delivered them either as our Megamer single-stranded DNA or as our GBLOX double-stranded DNA to see which would work better for uh, creating these inserts. And so one of the main <laughs> problems in analyzing these results is you get such a varied spectrum of repair products. 
So what I'm showing here is just kind of a snapshot of all of the various repair outcomes that are possible in these cells of interest. So you can have unedited native genomic DNA, where you would just have your five and three prime homology arms intact. Um, the NHEJ pathway can be used to generate indels at the cut site, and that's indicated with that red bar there, which uh, can be a varied <laughs> number of insertions or deletions, and it's um, really not consistent um, among the various uh, sites. Um, you can also get the HDR insertion. That's what we're looking for. That's our desired outcome. So this is where we've perfectly inserted what we're looking to without disrupting or duplicating the five or three prime homology arms. Um, in addition to the perfect HDR insertion, you can get these unwanted partial insertions where maybe just the five prime end was uh, inserted and you didn't get the complete insert that you were looking for. Or these donors can be blunt inserted at the cut site where you now have a duplication of your homology arms, either in uh, one orientation or reversed from what you were looking for, or you could get concatamerization, where you get multiple insertion events of these uh, donor <coughs> oligos. Um, so as I mentioned, the CRISPR-Cas9 um, indel profiles just coming out of NHEJ alone, so this isn't even looking at the, the repair products coming out of an HDR event, uh, they're really highly varied. So this is just a snapshot um, using short read Illumina um, paired end sequencing where we're showing all of the various repair products for just a single um, one guide delivered to cells. So you can see um, the deletions, there's a two base deletion, a five base deletion, and then various insertions as well. Um, three, six, up to a 20 base insertion. And so traditional analysis methods have made it challenging to look at the spectrum because a lot of them will try to form a consensus and all of these get normalized out as sequencing noise. Um, so that was uh, a challenge for us initially is figuring out how to, out how to analyze these um, various indels that are created by CRISPR editing. And so this slide is kind of walking through the various analysis methods when we're thinking about looking at CRISPR editing. Um, so if we're just trying to estimate our on-target editing frequency, um, there are a lot of different methods that can be used. Um, or if we're just trying to show that we have some fraction of HDR insertion, um, you can use PCR to amplify around the region of interest and then digest with um, a T7 or surveyor endonuclease that would recognize the indels um, after you form heteroduplexes. Um, you can also use HDR to create a novel restriction enzyme site and then PCR amplify and digest that. Um, but that doesn't really tell you the true editing of what exactly is happening in these cells of interest. Um, you can use qPCR or droplet digital PCR, which increases the sensitivity for these events. We know that, for example, the T7E1 assay doesn't capture single base insertions very well, so it'll underestimate your total editing frequency. So you can increase your sensitivity with uh, the droplet digital or qPCR assays, but that's still not telling you anything about the actual insertions and deletions that are present. Um, so you can use Sanger sequencing and tide analysis to get a better idea of the editing uh, repair profile. And that uses um, the Sanger sequencing trace out of a polyclonal population, and it deconvolutes that spectrum to try to give um, some amount of information about the insertions and deletions that are present. But we really find that next-gen sequencing is required to get the highest level of sensitivity and the ability to quantify the, the true correct fraction of HDR. Um, it also um, allows for multiplexing. Um, for example, we've just released a, our RAMPSeq multiplexed amplicon sequencing where we can combine up to a thousand different PCR amplicon reactions into a single tube, amplify that up, purify, and sequence to get a lot of information from a very um, small amount of sample prep. And so this amplicon sequencing on Illumina has been very efficient for us when looking at small insertions, but of course it's not able to look at these large 300 to 1,000 and even larger insertions that we're generating by HDR. So we really needed long read sequencing in order to, to start looking at this and capturing that information in, a, in, a, in an accurate way. And so these are some of the wet lab analysis methods that we've used in the past. For the past two to three years, we've been trying to really look at this large HDR insertion at IDT and we didn't have the capability to bring this long read sequencing in-house, so these are the proxy methods that we had to use to estimate uh, the insertion rates. So we've used our droplet digital junction PCR assays, where we have assays for either the five prime uh, insertion um, junction, 
or the three prime insertion junction. And then we've also developed assays to look at the blunt integration, either in one orientation or the opposite orientation of that um, insert. In addition, we have PCR, where we can PCR amplify around this region of interest and then look for various um, size differences by fragment analysis to kind of estimate the amount of insertion that we've had. Um, some of the cons with these methods, though, is, for example, the droplet digital would only capture or has the potential to capture partial insertions, which we don't really care about. We would like to be able to quantify what amount goes in in a partial rather than a full insertion. But what we really want to know is how much of this is complete, full insertion. That's what, we're, that's what our ultimate aim is. Um, there's also no single molecule resolution. So this is all done in a pooled population where we have a lot of different, um, it's a polyclonal cell population. And this would just tell you the, the relative frequency in that pool rather than what's happening in a single molecule. Um, and for the PCR method that, that really lacks sensitivity and also just looking at the fragment sizes doesn't tell you anything about if this is actually a correct insertion or if there are indels along with that insert present in your DNA. Um, here's some example data of what we've been able to generate historically at IDT using these methods where you can see um, on the left side we're looking at HDR insertion using the droplet digital junction assays either on the five prime or the three prime end in blue and gray respectively and then also that fragment analysis by PCR in the orange. And so some of the challenges that we've had in the past are we see that with the droplet digital, for example, the five and the three prime ends don't give the same results. And that's una we're unable to tell if that's from partial insertion or um, misquantification from the assays. And then also the PCR and fragment analysis shows lower HDR rates than the droplet digital, which is to be expected because you could pick up these partial ins insertion events. On the right side of the screen, you can see where we're looking for blunt insertion. So we know that double-stranded DNA has a uh, more likely uh, chance to go in blunt than single-stranded DNA, and that's something we've been very interested in looking at and quantifying. And so you can see when we use these droplet digital assays, we do identify blunt insertion with the double-stranded DNA donor uh, more so than the single-stranded DNA donor. But again, we're unable to really quantify what these events are and see them to know what is correct insertion. So that's where target enrichment using the MinION sequencer comes in. And this is uh, very new for us. We've only been doing this uh, in, in our lab for a few months now, so this is all very preliminary data. But I have to say, we've been really, really excited with what we've been able to accomplish after struggling with these methods for the past two and a half years. Uh, uh, so <laughs> um, on the left, you can see the previous methods that we had been using, and now um, the two methods that we have just started looking at, and that's um, targeted enrichment using PCR amplification or using the CRISPR-Cas9 enrichment. Um, and I do want to say that fortunately we had built this CRISPR alterations analysis pipeline to look at these varied indel profiles um, and it has been extensively validated for short read sequencing, but we built it with a capacity for long read support, which I have to tip my hat to our bioinformatics team for having this foresight, which has allowed us to bring this sequencing capability in-house really quickly. Um, so just uh, simply how this works is we have our library that we sequence, we align back to where that guide RNA is expected to cut, we map and align these reads to our reference and then interrogate and summarize all of the different variants that are occurring. And so now going back to the previous data I'd shown, I've added in some data generated and here we've used PCR amplicon enrichment where we have just a 2 kb PCR amplicon surrounding this expected CRISPR-Cas9 edit site. And you can see that we have um, actual sequencing data now. When we look at these alignments, we can see um, the five prime end going in more frequently as a partial insertion than the three prime end, which aligns with our droplet digital assays. And then we can also see where the PCR fragment analysis was slightly overestimating our true insertion rates. We now have really quantified the actual true perfect insertion by HDR using this method. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see now we can actually quantify and visualize these blunt insertion events. And we can categorize them as full blunt insertion in one orientation or the other, or catamerization or partial insertion. So we've really 
uh, achieve kind of the next level of information about all of these um, various CRISPR editing events. Um, unfortunately, I don't need to spend a lot of time on this slide because we had a lot of background already on the benefits of a PCR-free enrichment approach. Um, so we were obviously very interested in this. Um, since we're generating these large insertions and we intend to go larger in the future, we were really concerned about PCR bias between samples with no insertion and samples with this really large insertion. And then also um, there are a lot of regions where it's challenging to PCR amplify. Um, so we've utilized this Cas9 enrichment approach, of course, using the Altar Hi-Fi Cas9 that was developed by our R&D team that we're really proud of. Uh, and so this is just a single sample that we have been able to generate in the past uh, few weeks, I think, actually. So this is very new. Um, and looking at how this Cas9 target enrichment is comparing to this PCR amplicon enrichment. So you can see comparing to the previous methods, the amplicon sequencing is in green and the results coming out of this CRISPR-Cas9 enrichment are in blue on the far right, and we're getting virtually the same amount of HDR insertion between these orthogonal methods. So we are really happy to see two different methods giving us the same results. So we have a lot more we want to do with this. We want to um, use this for more detailed analysis, generate sequence alignments. Um, fortunately, we had this CRISPR alterations pipeline that allowed us to bring this in-house really rapidly. And then we have a lot more comparisons we want to do between the PCR amplification and Cas9 enrichment, looking at um, optimized methods, uh, comparing this bias with larger insertions, using synthetic data to really quantify if this is a factor, and then also looking into multiplexing capabilities. That's one of the great benefits of the Cas9 enrichment approach, is you can multiplex those RNP complexes. For example, to look at an on-target editing site and then many different known off-target editing sites for the Cas9. And then we also want to look into applying our RAMP-seq PCR uh, for multiplexing using the long read approach. So with that, I have to acknowledge my bioinformatics team. Gavin has really led the, led the efforts here along with Matt. And then Jessica Woodley has done uh, a lot of the work optimizing delivery of these large insertions. So I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you.